You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. Hey, I titled this morning's message, Carrying the Stone. Before we get into this morning's message, I'd like for us to take a moment and ask God to bless us on our journey. God, thank you so much for a chance to stand here in this place and share with this group of people a message from your word. Dear Lord, help me to rightly divide your word of truth, to share things that need to be heard. And help them to be heard, your Lord, in the way that they're meant to be heard. Let your spirit work on both sides in order that your word might hit its mark and accomplish its goal. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. I titled this morning's message, Carrying the Stones, because I'm going to tell a story about that a little bit later on. But that story is not a Bible story. Okay, I want to, want to say that several times during the morning because I don't want you to get confused. Carrying the Stone is the title that I gave it. Our focus text is going to be Psalms chapter 16, verses 8 to 11, and Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10. If you want to turn to those and kind of hold your finger and thumb in there in readiness, like always, it'll be on, on, on the screen as well. You know, there's a lot of folks who've been through a lot here recently. There's just no way around it. When you look at those hurricanes coming up through the Caribbean, pretty much making everything uninhabitable on the island of Berbuda, Antigua and Island, where I used to work, uh, a lot of the things wiped out there. St. Croix wasn't hit quite so bad. St. Thomas was ravaged. Comes up then through uh, uh, Florida. Wasn't quite as bad in Florida, but a lot of damage still going on. We learned just a little bit ago that Kelly's sister still living in a hotel. A lot of those things are going on. And it causes people to feel that they're broken. It causes them to feel just a little bit overwhelmed by all the things that they're facing. It, whenever your house has been rattled by the storm, it can be really, really hard on you. People begin to feel like God has in some way forsaken them. God, why, why me? They want God to assure them that he's, he still sees what's going on inside of their lives. They're just needing God's comfort. They're trying to live for him. I mean, they're trying really, really hard to live for him. But sometimes, rather than getting better, things actually end up getting worse. And that makes it really, really hard. It causes people to lose faith sometimes. They begin to question. They begin to wonder, God, do you really love me? And if you love me, why are you letting so many things pound me right now, one after another after another? My heart breaks when people are going through those kind of difficulties. I've seen them regularly in my ministry over the last 40 years. It happens one disaster hits, and another hits the same family, and another hits the same family, and they just begin to feel like, God, are you really there? Here's the wonderful thing. I've seen God work in their lives. When they remain faithful, I've seen them get back up on their feet, and I've seen them move forward, and I've seen them be effective. I know that God's working in their lives. I know that God loves them. But the memory of the victories that have happened in their life can sometimes be overshadowed by those hard times when they hit. Because we're human. The question is written all over their face when they're going through those kind of difficulties. You can't help but see it. You see the question there and that question. God, why is this happening to me? God, why didn't you stop this from happening? You've got the power... Why didn't you stop this from happening? You ever wondered that? We're human. God, why are those sinful ninnies over there prospering when I'm struggling like this? You ever wondered that? Sometimes we just look up at God and we say, God, why does life have to be so hard? It's just a reality. Sometimes you feel that way. Sometimes it's like, God, 
why don't you just explain yourself so I can understand this. I know you've got the big view, but I don't have it. And God, I don't know what you're thinking here. Could you just explain it to me? Because this is getting to be just a little bit too much. When the bad times come, so does this little three-letter question that sometimes overwhelms us. The question, why? Why, God? Why is this happening to me? You know, many times, the people who are asking that question, why? Myself included. We have been blessed over and over again. But when the difficult times come, we have a tendency to forget all about them. And all we want to know is, God, why? Why is this going on in my life? The challenges of life, you see, have taken our focus off of God. And we feel like we're drowning. We feel like we're sinking. Remember Peter, whenever Jesus was walking along on the water? And he said, if it's you, Lord, let me come out to where you are. Jesus says, come on down. Peter steps over the side of that boat and he starts to walk toward Jesus. But it says he began to look at the waves and the wind. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And when he did, he started to sink. I think that's what happens sometimes. We take our eyes off of Jesus and the storms around us try to take us down. The beautiful thing is when Jesus reached down and grabbed Peter and pulled him up and helped him back into the boat. If he did that for Peter, he'll do that for us as well. And I'm extremely thankful for that. Because sometimes I feel like I'm grounding just like y'all. Whenever I counsel folks who are going through these kind of difficulties, sometimes I feel like I'm drowning myself. I'm overwhelmed by it. People come to my office and they lay out what's going on in their life and I'm not going to tell you the specifics of people's counsel or anything like that because they don't do that. But what I hear again is, why God? God, you don't really love me. If you love me, this wouldn't be happening. God, why? And they sit there and they say, I just can't believe in God anymore. I just can't trust him anymore. I've reached my limit. I can't go any farther. And I'm sitting there overwhelmed. And I'm trying to find the right words to say to them. And sometimes, sometimes the man inside of me wants to shake him and say, stop it! Just stop it! You ever want to just do that? Just quit saying those bad things about my Heavenly Father. Quit saying those bad things about Jesus. I know it's rough right now, but I know He loves you. He loves you this much. Elizabeth Elliot shared an old folk tale. It's an African legend. I want to make sure that you understand. This story is not in the Bible. It never really happened. You got that? I want to make sure that, that you understand that. And the reason I want to make sure that you understand that is because it's going to use Jesus and some of the apostles in it. And I don't want you thinking this is in the Bible and go home and look for it and come back and say, Preacher, it wasn't in there. I'm telling you up front, it's not in there. <laughs> You're not going to find it. It's a made up story, a legend. But what it teaches is very, very true. It's the legend of the two stones. The legend of the two stones. Here's how it goes. Jesus was walking along one day with two of his disciples, Peter and John, just strolling along. And as they're strolling along, he looks over at Peter and John and he says, I want you guys to pick up a stone and carry it for me. Just pick up a stone and carry it for me. So Peter looks down and finds some little stone, a little pebble. <laughs> you know how Peter was, a little stone. Picks up a little stone and he's carrying that along. But John, he picks up a pretty good-sized stone. I mean, he, he, he's, he wants to carry a stone that's a good size for Jesus because he's not exactly sure what's going on. So he picks up a good one. And here's Peter and, and John walking along with these two stones. And Jesus led them all the way up the side of a huge mountain. And whenever they got all the way to the top of that mountain, he had them sit down. And when they sat down, Jesus turned their stones into bread. Now it had been a long, hard journey up the mountain. Jesus knew that they were hungry. 
So he says, okay, you can eat your bread now. Well, Peter had only picked up a little pebble. He looked at that, and he looked over at John, looked at that, looked over at John, looked at that. He's looking at John's bread, and John finally said, oh, it's okay, Peter. You can have some of mine. So they, they shared the bread amongst themselves. And that sharing made everything equitable. A few days later, they're walking along the trail again. And Jesus looks over at Peter and John and says, I'd like for you guys to carry a stone for me. You should have seen their eyes light up. They had a smile grinning from ear to ear. Man, <laughs> they went over and they picked up some monster stones. I mean, they just, they're hecking these big old stones. And they carry them along. And then they go by the trail that leads to the mountain. And Jesus turns the opposite direction. They're still lugging these big old stones along. They're anticipating. They're wanting to know. They're carrying these stones. He leads them right over to the edge of a river. And then he looks at it and says, Okay, throw your stones in there. Well, they don't understand it. They thought they were going to the mountain. They're at the river. But who knows what Jesus might do. So they took their stones and they threw them into the river. They were confused, but they were obedient. And then they looked at Jesus. And they looked at the water. They were getting more and more confused. I mean, they were waiting on the miracle that he was going to work. They looked at Jesus waiting expectantly for the miracle that they were sure he was going to do. But nothing. Nothing happened. No bread. No fish, not even figs. There was nothing. They waited and they watched, but nothing happened. <laughs> Finally, Jesus looked over at Peter and John and he asked them a very important question. He said, who did you carry those stones for? Who did you carry those stones for? Did you carry them in anticipation of what they were going to bring to you? Or did you carry them because you really loved me? I think we need to ask ourselves the same question sometime. Who are we carrying the stones for? For ourselves? for our success, for our notoriety. Maybe it's some great big dream that we have and we think, man, if we'll just be faithful to God, He's going to give us what we want. Our dream's going to be fulfilled. Do we carry stones hoping for blessings? Or do we carry the weight of our stones because we truly love Jesus? The psalmist paints a beautiful picture of God's overwhelming sacrifice on our part. It's not really a big, deep theological thing. It just shares the truth in a unique way. And in that psalm, he makes it clear that Jesus carried his stone for us. Let's read it together. Psalms chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. It says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Now get this. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Do you know later in the New Testament Jesus says that was about Him. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus he carried a stone for us. He didn't decay in that tomb. He rose from the dead, but he carried the stone for you and me. He fulfilled this prophecy, carrying the stone for you and for me. He suffered, and he bled, and he died in your place and in mine. He took upon himself the whole weight of our sin, and then he rose victorious, there's no way. I had someone tell me this week that there was a way 
But I don't believe there's any way. There is no way that our struggles, no matter how large, can match this act of love Jesus did for us on Calvary. Jesus, the sinless one, became sin for us so that we might be saved. There's nobody else that can say he took on the sins of the whole world. He is the only one. That's a burden none of us could possibly bear and a burden that Jesus bore. We should never label ourselves followers of Jesus Christ until we've truly taken up our stone, our cross, if you will, and decided to follow him. Sometimes we get so aggravated at the piddly little things, but when you compare them to what Jesus did, they really aren't that big at all. But that doesn't mean they're not hard, because they are, but they can't compare to what Jesus did for us. Until our hearts cry out, God, I will follow you no matter what, until we get to that point, until we're willing to say, God, I will pay any price to wear your name, whatever it takes. I'm at your disposal, Lord. Use me. Until we get to that point, I don't think we really surrendered to him. We're still holding things back for ourselves. Do you obey the Lord because you think doing so is going to benefit you? I mean, if I come to church, I get to meet my friends, I get to visit, I get to have fellowship. Sometimes they have potlucks. I mean, I mean, why do you follow Jesus? Do you follow him because of what you're going to get? Or do you follow the Lord because you just flat out love him? I think we need to ask ourselves that question. Do you carry your stone because you love Jesus? Or do you carry it in hope that in doing so, you'll be blessed by God. Sometimes we obey, we carry the stone, because deep down inside, we think doing so is going to bring us blessing. When we act that way, what we're really doing is we're treating God as our magic genie. See what I'm saying? Yeah, God, I'm going to come rub the preacher's bald head and say a prayer with him. And then you're going to bless me, God. It doesn't work that way. There's not like a switch of blessings that you can rub my head and say a prayer and, and get everything you ask for, everything you want. In essence, what I hear from those people breaks my heart. And I sat there when someone left my office this week with tears in my eyes because my heart was broken. In essence, they were saying, God, I'll love you if you give me what I want. But if you're not going to give me what I want... I'm not going to follow you anymore. You know how bad that hurts my heart? God, I'll love you if you make my life easier. But if not, I'm out of here. God, I'll serve you if that means I can avoid these hardships. But if I've got to go through these hardships, I'm out of here, God. We act as if God owes us something because we've been faithful servants. And that is just not the case. The fact is, God owes us nothing. Let me say that again. God owes us nothing. I want to make sure you're with me. God owes us nothing. In Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10, we read these words. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly, serve me while I eat and drink, afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all, see that word? When you have done all, everything, completely everything, when you've done all that you were commanded, just say we're unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. God doesn't owe us a thing. When we carry our stone and find ourselves blessed with bread, it's really easy to rejoice. But when we carry our stone and God doesn't bless us like we want to be blessed, it's really easy to get upset and confused. We feel like the greater the obedience, the, the heavier the burden, the bigger the stone, if you will, 
the larger the spiritual payoff at the end. It doesn't work that way. God is not a magic genie. The question is, are you willing to serve God even when it doesn't benefit you in this life? It will benefit you in eternity, but it will not always show here on this earth. When there's no payoff, are you willing to follow Jesus? The fact is, there's going to be times when we're going to stand at the riverbank and we're going to glance between the river where we've thrown our stone and Jesus. We're going to look back and forth and back and forth just like John and Peter. And we're going to wonder, what in the world are you doing, God? I don't get it. What are you doing, God? Why did things turn out this way, God? Man, I've been obedient, God. I don't understand it. I've been doing what you asked me to do. I mean, I've gone to church. I listened to that guy preach. I sat there through the whole thing. I tried to pray, God. You know I opened up that Bible and, and I flipped pages and I stopped and I read verses here and there. I, I've been inside the Bible, God. I gave sacrificially. I didn't have much, but I gave some anyway. I carried my stone for you, Jesus. Where is my blessing? I want it now. <laughs> it's at that moment that it should hit us. What we've discovered about ourselves is this. If we feel that way, we're carrying the stone for ourselves, not for Jesus. So I ask you this morning, who are you carrying the stone for? It's been said that hardships bring out the best in people. Hardships give us a chance to carry our stone. We've all seen stirring images these last few weeks. People in Houston, people in the Caribbean, people in Florida. Overwhelming pictures. What some fail to see is the reflection of God's own character in all of these moving images. Compassionate volunteers. Do you see them in the, in the newsreels going into that nursing home? Volunteers pulling these old folks in wheelchairs out of the nursing home, helping get them into boats in order that they could be taken out of Houston. God at work through people. Rescue workers, neck deep in rushing water, trying to save the lives of others. God working through people. A flotilla of private boats rescuing stranded residents. God working through people. I think the impulse sometimes is sacrificing one's own life for another. I think it reflects God's spirit in us. We're willing to sacrifice our life in order to save their life because we love God and we love His people. I think doing the right thing is more than simple instinct. It's the echo of the very nature of God inside of us. Our hope of glory, if you will. Families weeping over the death of their loved one just as Jesus wept near the tomb of his friend Lazarus. He understands. Ordinary men walking through flooded streets carrying a woman who's carrying her baby. Jesus has carried our burden. He understands. People ask, where is God during these storms of life? Where are you, God? Why do I feel so all alone? And the whole time, God was mourning with those who mourned the loss of their loved ones. The whole time, God was inspiring acts of compassion by those who risked their lives in the rushing water to save others. God was directing those who carried people to safety. He was involved. God was doing all of this through the power of his very nature, which he has stamped inside of every man, woman, and child. We are created in the image of God. God's not absence. God's just very, very subtle. He hides himself in plain sight, but he can be found. He can be found when we learn to look for the clues, when we begin to see the things that point to him. The clues are abundant right now. I mean, you can see them all over the place. Millions of people wanting to help those who have been devastated by the hurricanes. Not for the fame it can bring, not for monetary reward, but because it's the will of God for them to love him and love others. They're carrying their stone. For whom do you carry your stone? God's giving us a chance to carry a stone for him. 
here's what I want us to do. Let's start right now preparing for next week. Okay. Next week's offering, all of it, is going to go to Samaritan's Purse. The churches in Newmarket are all going to come together. They're going to cancel their Sunday school classes. They're going to cancel their Sunday morning worship. And at 1030, we're going to meet over at the park next Sunday. Whenever we get there, we're going to have a combined worship service. And the offering taken up at that community service is going to be given to those victims. I'd like for us to begin now planning to give at that offering. Decide what you can do to help those victims above and beyond your normal giving and help them out. Let them know that you love them. You may not have the ability to wade through the water and carry someone, but maybe you can pay the gas bill for someone who does. If you're ready to carry your stone, we ask that you make it known as we stand and as we sing our invitation again this morning because he lives. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at Newmarket Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.